So I got back after the election last November <laughs> to my Senate office six days after the election, and there was a letter on my desk. It was a letter from an eight-year-old fourth grader in Charlottesville named Penelope, and this was the letter. Dear Senator Kane, I'm sorry you're not vice president, but senator's important. <laughs> Can you help stop my classmates from being deported? Second paragraph of the letter said, I've done a drawing to give you encouragement, and it fluttered out of the envelope in Sharpies, and here it is. Um, in Sharpies, made me thinner, <laughs> Ma made me younger, Penelope gave me more hair. She gets the details right, senators wear little lapel pins. I love the cape with the T on it, but I really love the motto, be the hero. Be the hero. Help stop my classmates from being deported. This is what an eight-year-old has to worry about now. I meet a lot of people, I meet a lot of people who are disappointed as I travel around Virginia and travel around the country, but a big subset of the disappointed are personally afraid. I meet immigrants who are afraid. I was walking through the basement of the Senate and I ran into a guy that I know who works there who's Salvadoran American and I said, K.I., what's up? And he said to me in Spanish, I'll tell you what's up. People look at my family and me like we're criminals now. We've lived in this country for 25 years and we've worked, I've worked in the Senate for 20 years and they look at us like we're criminals. I meet a lot of women, especially young women who are afraid. Am I going to lose jobs to a less qualified man? Am I going to get sexually harassed at my workplace? How come you guys keep whittling away women's health care and there's never a controversy about men's health care? I meet students who are afraid. Our leaders don't even accept climate science. What's the planet going to be like when I get to be an adult? I meet parents who are afraid. Are you really going to take our health care away when I got a disabled kid and we rely on the ACA and Medicaid to help our child afford a wheelchair and be able to get special ed at school? And my colleagues and I, when we talk and when we're honest, many of us are afraid that a president who demeans diplomacy raises the risk of unnecessary war. A lot of people are disappointed. A big subset of those who are disappointed are afraid. How do we deal with our fears? 230 years ago, last month, the framers of our Constitution met and finalized the Constitution in Philadelphia, and they were afraid of some things. First, the national government was a failure. After the glorious win in the revolution for seven or eight years, we just foundered along because there really wasn't a national government. It was 13 states kind of battling with each other. Veterans who had been promised pensions, there was nobody to pay their pensions, and so they gathered in Philadelphia to do something different. They knew they needed to create a national government, but they were afraid of that too. They were afraid if they created a national government, if they had a president, they could end up with a despot. Because what did they know in 1787? They knew kings, they knew monarchs, they knew emperors, they knew sultans, they knew popes. They were worried about the tendency of an executive to become a despot. And so they acted on their fear by designing a system to hand out our superpowers, by handing out powers to all kinds of people to check against the possibility of a despot. They put Congress first and gave Congress interesting powers, powers to ratify treaties, power of the purse, power to declare war, power to confirm appointments. They created a judiciary, and get this, they gave judges life tenure. That was revolutionary then, and it still is. Why would you create judges for life? They did it so that a judge could stand up and say that executive order or that statute is unconstitutional without any fear of losing their job. They gave huge powers to states and to governors. They gave powers when they did the Bill of Rights a couple years later to the press to check abuses and hold leaders accountable. But the most important powers that they handed out were the powers that they handed out to everyday citizens. The, the power to vote, which has been expanded over time, the power to run for office, but it's much more than that. It's not just 
campaigning and running. The power to peacefully assemble. The power to petition your government for redress of grievances. The right to bear arms. The right to worship or not as you please without being preferred or punished for how you worship. What the founders did 230 years ago is they handed out superpowers to virtually every institution and person in this country to try to check against abuses of power and give us tools to protect people we love and to deal with our own fears. Folks, we're living through the stress test of our constitutional democracy. We're living through exactly the moment that James Madison and the others knew we would live through. Exactly the moment. We have a president who trashes Congress, trashes the courts, trashes the press, trashes notions of religious equality and even equality generally. We have a president who promised greatness without offering evidence of goodness. And the challenge that we deal with today, and other generations have dealt with this challenge, is were the mechanisms, were the superpowers we were given 230 years ago, are they up to the task? Are they up to the task that the framers intended? And I think we're seeing great evidence that they are. Congress, after repeatedly promising to get rid of the Affordable Care Act, when really faced with it, has decided not to repeal and take health care away from tens of millions of people. And instead, now I, as a member of the HELP Committee, am involved in a bipartisan effort to find ways to fix, not destroy, health care. Judges are standing up. The Muslim travel ban, for example, courts have stood up and said, you really can't do that. The Attorney General said about one judge in Hawaii, this is a quote, I can't believe that a judge, quote, on an island in the Pacific can tell the president what to do. That's a complaint you can take to James Madison. <laughs> governors, governors are saying, Mr. President, you're out of the Paris Climate Accord. Guess what? We're not backing out. Our state's going to stick with the Paris Climate Accord. The press is doing some amazing work these days to look at financial improprieties and questions of collusion with foreign adversaries. But the most inspiring thing that's being done is being done by you. The women's marches that had crowds far greater than the inauguration. <laughs> the, um, the, the calls, letters, emails to my office and keep them coming. But the numbers have gone up multiples of what they were before. People coming out to town hall meetings, regular citizens saying, hold on a second, do this, and this is unacceptable. We're seeing it in amazing numbers in every congressional office. And in fact, there's no way, there's no way we could have saved the Affordable Care Act had it not been for people reaching out in such numbers. My favorite of all were the protests at airports after the Muslim travel ban was announced because it was not pre-announced. You didn't know it was coming. And if there's bad controversial news, it's always going to be done after business closes on Friday. So it was January 29th. And it was announced, and people spontaneously turned out to airports. I don't know if some of you were at Dulles. I, I, I saw there's protests at Dulles. So I said, I'm going to go see these protests at Dulles. I went to the international arrival gate to see the protesters. Protesters calls up a picture in your mind. These were families with kids with signs like, Virginia is for lovers. Um, <laughs> we're, we're not anti-Muslim. Uh, my favorite was a family with some young kids and a big poster of Mr. Rogers, welcome to my neighborhood. <laughs> I, I got back to the Senate after this, and I was so excited to tell my Senate colleagues, you won't believe what I saw at Dulles. And a friend of mine, Joe Donnelly from Indiana, said, Tim, it was the same way in Indianapolis. We all turned out, but there's no international arrivals there. <laughs> we, 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 we were hugging people from Columbus and Chicago <laughs> and saying, we love you, we don't hate you. Welcome to the Hoosier State. Penelope asked if I'd be a hero. I think there's a lot of heroes out there battling for her. But I can't sugarcoat it. I can't pretend like the systems coming to life have avoided all the bad or checked all the bad because they haven't. Words have consequences. 
Actions have consequences. Votes have consequences. Silence has consequences. Inaction has consequences. And we're living through consequences, and a lot of them are really painful. I don't have to tell Penelope, she knows. When white supremacists felt emboldened, even emboldened by this president enough to come to her town and march with weapons and chant blood and soil and Jews shall not replace the statements from Nazi era Germany. And when one of them murdered a beautiful young paralegal and injured 19 other people, and the events of that day caused the deaths of two state troopers who I knew very, very well, I can't say to Penelope and I can't say to you that these systems and checks that are coming to life are sufficient to avoid all the bad. I'd like to tell Penelope about her request of me because she was writing me about dreamers that I can keep dreamers from being deported. I can tell her that I'll do everything I can. I'll tell her that I think Congress will find a solution after the president has decided to unplug the program, but I can't guarantee to her, I can't guarantee to her that I can accomplish what she wants me to. So we can't sugarcoat the reality that we live in, but still to an amazing degree, you see these checks and balances roaring to life. And you see people out there, many, who are trying to be heroes for Penelope and others who are afraid. When I was a young man, I lived in a military dictatorship, Honduras. I was a Jesuit missionary there, and it was an eye-opening experience in a lot of ways. One of the ways was this. I realized for the first time, wow, this clique at the top, these generals, they run everything, and there's no rule or institution that they can't change at a whim. People have no barrier, no protection between themselves and power, even arbitrary power from those at the top. And it made me realize now that I'm on the Armed Services and Foreign Relations Committee and I get around the world a little bit that most people in the world still live in a system like that where they don't have the superpowers assigned to them and they don't have those protective barriers that were erected by Madison and others in 1787 that they can use to deal with the fears that they have. I have a prediction about this chapter in our life. It's a chapter with some pain, and there's going to be more, but I do think the end of the chapter is going to be this, that in this country, in this country, the institutions and the collective power of the American public is stronger than any individual, whether that be a president, a senator, or anybody else. I really believe that that is the end of this chapter, and it will speak to the wisdom of what these founders did, what they started to do 230 years ago. Now, my prediction depends on something. Superpowers aren't superpowers if you don't use them. So, if you were just a quirky kid in Brooklyn and you realized that you had spidey senses and you didn't know and you didn't do anything with them, you would just be a quirky kid in Brooklyn named Peter. But when you use them to fight Dr. Octopus and save New York, you're Spider-Man, right? Superpowers are only superpowers if you use them. So to Penelope's request about be the hero, you're a hero when you run for office. You're a hero when you vote. You're a hero when you march, when you organize, when you peacefully protest. You're a hero when you pester your congressman, senator, city council person, school board member about something that matters to you. You are using the superpowers that James Madison and others gave to you. Be the hero. Be the hero. I, I, I guess I should just conclude and mention that I told Penelope I was going to be talking about her today. And I told her she was lucky. She wrote me and asked me to be the hero. And I said, you're the hero because you did what you ought to do. You wrote to your member of Congress and said, here's something that worries me. Can you help me out? Penelope, you're a hero. And you have a whole lot of people out here all around this country who are battling every day to be your heroes. And when Penelope heard me say this, well, guess what? She decided to do a drawing for you guys too. Thanks so much. Thank <laughs> you.